Hello, in this video we will talk about successive approximations and generally how to find x. So, how do you go about finding x? So, a couple different ways to do this. One, if it's a second order polynomial and you do the algebra and find a, b, and c, I'm happy if you put a quadratic solver in your calculator, so I'll talk about that. Um, another way to go about this is assume that x is small and you can neglect x when you're adding or subtracting it, and that then simplifies your algebra. Another way to do this is, well, just solve the quadratic formula by hand. And then the new way that we're going to talk about here is how to use the method of successive approximations to then get to your answer. And so let me scoot these over to the side so we can keep track of what we're doing. All right. So the quadratic solver. So it's up to you to figure out how to do this. I'm sure if you Google it, you'll be set. It's not required that you do this, but it'll help you out. And so if you do use the quadratic solver on the exam, you just have to show me the algebra to find A, B, and C, and then write the little phrase, hey, I used the quadratic solver thingy, and then just tell me what the two roots are for X. Now, one thing I do not want you to do is just solve the whole mule deal in your calculator. So don't type in just the Ka expression and solve for x. I want to see the work beyond that, because if it's just a game of plugging it into your fancy fancy calculator, well, then we're advantaging students with the expensive calculators, and I don't want to do that. But I figure that almost any scientific calculator, or at least graphing calculator, can do a quadratic solving thing, so you're welcome to do that. Okay. The next thing on our list is to talk about how we go about neglecting x. And let me use an example to motivate what this means. So say we're doing an acid-base problem, calculate the concentration of H3O plus for 2 molar hydrofluoric acid, and here's the Ka. And then from the concentration of H3O plus, you can then find the pH, because, well, you'll see why. Okay, so here's the icebox for this. And then the initial concentrations go in like so and then minus x plus x going to the right. Here's the equilibrium line. This should be just like what we've done before, so that shouldn't be a surprise. And then this is why you can use the concentration of H3O to find you the pH, because that's what we normally do. Um, and that's just equal to x. Great, so we just need to find x. So here's our equation for Ka, just like we've always done. And, all right, let's plug the numbers in here. And, oh, bonkers, we can't solve this easily. Okay, so here's the neglect x part of it, is we're going to assume that 2 minus x is equal to 2. And this is a reasonable assumption if your Ka is small, and that gives you reason to assume your x is going to be small, and then also if your concentration is large, because 2 minus something small is more likely to be a good approximation than something small minus something small. But we'll check this when we're done to see if it's a good approximation. All right, so this is what we do. So let me get this out of the way, scoot this up. All right, so when you do this, um, you're basically solving 7.1 times 10 to the negative fourth equals x squared divided by 2. So you multiply both sides by 2 and then take the square root. And then that gives you this value for x. Okay, so was this a good assumption? Um, so you have to check that, right? Have to check to see how much of an error you might have introduced by assuming this, um, that 2 minus x equals 2. So the way to do this, and the kind of rule that we say, is figure out what percentage of 2.0 is x. That's a horrible way to phrase it. But basically, uh, how big is x compared to 2? And so the way you do that is you take your x and divide it by the number you subtract it from, and then see what that percentage is. Multiply it by 100 to get a percent. And so um, our x value is 1.9% of the value of 2. And that's good. Because we're going to draw the line in this course that it's okay to neglect x if it's less than 5% of whatever you're subtracting it from or adding it to. And the reason why this is okay is because in the world of acid-base chemistry, it's really hard to determine Ka values precisely. That's why we only ever have two sig figs on them at most. And so, you know, Ka values can be plus or minus 5%. So then it seems reasonable to let our value of x affect our answer to plus or minus 5%. Ideally, it's less than that, but hey, it'll work. For reference, for this problem, here's what you get if you solve it with the quadratic. A little different, but not too far off. 
All right, well, let's find another example and see if we can find a place where this doesn't work. So do the same exact problem, except instead of two molar, we now have 0.02 molar hydrofluoric acid. Let's see what that does. Here's Ka, and now we're putting in 0.02 on the denominator instead of two. Okay, so let's assume that x is small. Toss that out of there. So now we have 7.1 times 10 to the negative fourth. Multiply that by 0.02, because you multiply it to both sides. Take the square root, and you get x. Well, is this a good assumption or not? We should check it. So another way to phrase this is x less than 5% of what you subtracted it from. And the answer is no. You can take the value of x, divide it by what you subtracted it from, multiply by 100, you get 19%. x is 19% of our number. That's a bad approximation. Another way you can do this is like so. So let's take our value and multiply it by 5%. And we see that, okay, 5% of this number is 0 0.001. So that's our allowed error, right? We can't have our x being bigger than this. So then if you compare them, well, x is bigger than that. So therefore, this is no good. So choose one of these methods to check. Whichever one makes more sense to you is fine. And moral of the story is you got to check your assumption. And in this case, it's not fine. And you know I did this on purpose because I wanted to show what it looked like uh, when you had a bad assumption. So what do we do from here? Um, we really only have two options. One, since this is a second order polynomial, we can solve the quadratic formula manually. Or two, we can use the method of successive approximations. So I'll talk about them in turn. So if you're gonna solve the quadratic, well, you take this equation, here's the quadratic formula and what it represents, which hopefully shouldn't be a surprise. And then you do the algebra and you figure out what a, B, and C are. The algebra here is actually better than it was before um, in the previous chapter, um, just uh, by happenstance, really. And then plug this into the quadratic formula, solve it, you get these two roots. Now you gotta throw out the root that doesn't make sense, which is typically the negative one. So if you chuck that, then you find X, 0 0.003430. Okay, this is the truth, right? This is how you solve this unambiguously to get the right answer. Sometimes it's kind of a pain in the butt. You know, putting this all together into the quadratic formula and doing the algebra, there's a reason why I didn't put it on the PowerPoint slide. So, okay, what else can we do? Let's try this. This is new, the method of successive approximations. Okay, so we're still using the same sample, the same setup, the same equation. Now, how do we do this? So the first thing you do is you neglect x, just like we did before. So assume that 0 0.020 minus x is equal to 0 0.020. And then you solve that through and you get x, the same value we had a few slides ago. All right. So now what you do is you plug the x back into the addition subtraction part of the original equation. So before it was 0 0.020 minus x in the denominator, and now you just plug x right in there. But not on the top, because now you're gonna solve for x on the top. The one that's multiplied all together, you solve for that on the top. And you get this value for x. And again, you're not approximating here, you're just taking x and plugging it in. Mm, okay, so you get a new value for x. It's different, which makes sense. Um, and now what you do is you compare. If these two values um, change within the allotted number of significant figures, then you gotta try it again, which we'll have to do here because these two are different within the two sig figs we have. Now if they have not changed, then you're done and you use the most recent x as your x value and then it's solid. So, okay, we gotta try it again. So we're gonna take x2, I'll label them like this, right? So the second x that we find, we're gonna take that, scoot it up to the top of the slide, and then go again. So we take the same formula, but now we plug in the second x in the denominator, and then we solve for x, and now we get the third x. Are we there yet? Well, remember, we need to compare the last two x values, and this time they're the same. To two sig figs, we get 0 0.0034, and so that's it. This is the answer we can use, um, and use x3, and then you're done. Now, to compare this to the quadratic, which is the truth, right, 0 0.0034, well, you get that same answer with both successive approximations and the quadratic formula. And you know, if you had kept iterating the successive approximations more times, 
you would probably get it even closer to the answer from the quadratic. And by iterate, we mean plug x in, solve for x. Then you do it again. You plug the new x in, solve for x. That's called iterating. Cool, so now we have three different ways to solve for x here. For this particular problem, neglecting x is not going to work. You're welcome to use either the quadratic formula or the method of successive approximations. Now, always check your answer. I'll check the one from the quadratic formula, but you know whichever one you use, check it. And you do this by just plugging it in. So here's our formula that we've been working with. And now we're going to plug x into this formula and make sure that what's on the right side here um, matches what's on the left side. So you do this, you get 7.1 times 10 to the negative fourth again. Perfect, we did the right x. The reason why I'm big on this is because I see on exams a lot, people just mess up the algebra and they don't notice. And so if you do this, plug this in, and you find it doesn't work, that means you messed up the algebra somewhere and you can go back and find it. So it's always a good idea to do this. Okay, and then before we finish, I have some more notes on the new thing, the method of successive approximations. And so it may take more than three tries, right? I've seen textbook problems with answers that take five or six tries. Um, it may not converge, like you may run into a weird problem where it doesn't work and it just goes the wrong direction and goes to heck. But on a test, I won't give you a problem that does that. Um, but And also, we were doing this here for quadratic things, second order polynomials. But if you've got something that's cubic or something that's a higher order polynomial, uh, you're not solving that with the quadratic formula. This is really the only way to go about it if you can't just neglect x. You won't find this in the current chapter with Ka because the Ka formula does not go beyond second order. But say you're doing some equilibria like here, right? So you have something with a 3 in it or something that has enough parts that add up to 3, you might go cubic. And so, hey, why not? Let me throw a quick little example in here. So if you have 3a in equilibrium with b, some weird triple combination reaction that probably would never happen in real life, um, and you have some amount of a initially, what are your concentrations at equilibrium? Here's the equilibrium constant, okay. Here's the form of the equilibrium constant. Trust me, when you do the icebox, you'll get this. You'll get the kc, and then x on the top, and 0 0.50 minus 3x cubed on the bottom. Now, when you do methods of successive approximations, the x in the denominator, the one that's in the cube, start that as 0, basically, so neglect it, and then you solve for x1. Now you can't get away with just neglecting it because you get a 12% error if you do that, no good. And then if you keep going, well, here's x2, and you find x2 by taking x1 and plugging it back into the denominator and solving again. And then you repeat, x3, x4. Hey, between x3 and x4 it didn't change, so that means use x4 and you're done. And you're not going to solve this really any other way um, without a computer or a fancy calculator. So it's good to know for that. So thanks for hanging in there. That's all I have for this video. And I'll leave you with this, your moment of zen.